one day we get a call from Joni Mitchell's photographer, whose name is Joel, but I, and I know we can look up his name on, on uh, the internet, but um, last name. And he said, Joni and I are driving in Staten Island and we'd like to come over and visit you. I said, ooh, that'd be great. So they came up to the shop and I have to say, this was the original location of the shop, which used to be 580 Bay Street in Stapleton, which is a waterfront area, and a bit seedy, which if you're going to start a company, a new company, it's okay to be in a seedy area of your beginnings. And it was definitely that. And they came, it was a second floor walk up, and they came upstairs, and Joni was just wonderful, charming, delightful, beautiful, everything that we know about her. One of the world's finest singer-songwriters that I've ever heard. And, and still is, in my opinion, and uh, chose two instruments, one of which was a very old, very beautiful 1913 Martin 00028 herringbone, and the other was unexpected. It was a Gibson mandocello called a K4, which is a very large, very fancy um, barit not, well, baritone, I would say baritone-voiced instrument. Yeah. The mandolin family is comprised of uh, the soprano, which is the mandolin, the uh, alto, which is the mandola, which is the equivalent of the viola, and then the, uh, the octave mandolin, which there is no equivalent of in the violin family, which is an octave below mandolin, and then the mandocello, which is the baritone. And she loved that sound. It was, it's still an exciting sound, like no other sound you've ever heard, very rumply and very dark and it's tuned lower than a guitar. So it adds something that, to the mix that no one is used to hearing, and it can be very effective in a recording studio. And, and she bought both instruments. At that time, our head of repair was John Monteleone, who is considered the most illustrious and highest level luthier, guitar builder that is, in the United States of America. There was a Metropolitan Museum of Art exhibit last year, um, that was D'Angelico, Di Cristo, and Monteleone. Of course, John is the only guy who's still alive, but what an honor to be in, a, in an exhibit at the Metropolitan. And uh, we had hired him. He was, uh, he was teaching in the BOCES program in Long Island and uh, was looking for an opportunity to work in the music industry. And so we hired him in 1973 or 72, I forget. And uh, he was there uh, and able to set up the guitars that Joni bought, and uh, she told us specifically what she wanted. Well, this is where the story gets really interesting. On the way home, when she left us in the car, she had an idea for a song. And the song was autobiographical. And in an interview much later, she said that this song, which is titled Song for Sharon, is the most introspective, the most autobiographical song she's ever written, and also one of her favorites. And it starts off with the line, I went to Staten Island, Sharon, to buy myself a mandolin. And she rhymes mandolin with mannequin. She sees a, uh, the, dress, uh, the white dress of love on a store-bought mannequin. And it's a story about how her life diverged from her friend Sharon's life in Canada. Sharon has the, the big house with the picket white fence and the, the two and a half children. And Joni's life was a professional life. And so... It's a, it's a very wistful song and a very beautiful song with wonderful guitar work and wonderful melody. And um, We didn't know what to say. I mean, that's just it's an honor to have one of the greatest singer-songwriters write a song just based on and derived from the experience of coming out to Staten Island to buy herself a mandolin. Uh, and she wrote some of it on the Staten Island ferry because at that time, pre-9-11, you could still take your car on the ferry and so one of the lines in the song is big boat churning with a belly full of cars, which is so beautiful. And that was the way it was, and um, which took her back to Manhattan, and she had a home in Manhattan. When it, I mean, it didn't come out for a while, but it came out on an album called Hajira, which is a wonderful album. It, it has the song Amelia on it, which is lovely, and, and a bunch of other famous Joni Mitchell songs. And uh, then it reappeared again in a retrospective album called Songs of a Country Girl, uh, around two or three years ago. So you could tell she liked that song. Meeting famous people is a whole other subject. And we've gotten virtually the entire world of acoustic players have been here or we've done business with them. We've sold two pieces to Bob Dylan. 
we've sold pieces. Well, uh, Bruce Springsteen and his wife bought him a mandolin, a beautiful, fancy mandolin for a Christmas present. Here's a big one. <laughs> George Harrison's wife wanted to buy him a Christmas present and, and called up and we had a national ukulele, which is very rare, they're really hard to find, uh, today, pre-war, and she, we spoke about it, and she chose it, and we sent it to her, and she gave it to him for Christmas, and I, he loved it. And when he was in New York, subsequently, around 1993, he was in a limo, and the driver of the limo said, happened to mention, oh, I'm from Staten Island, and George Harrison said, Staten Island? do you think we could visit Mandolin Brothers? And the driver says, yeah, I've been there a lot of times. I can take you right there. And so they came over one day. They, they just walked in the front door as like you would anyone else. Unlike Joni, he didn't call for us. He should have called for us, but he didn't. And, um, and we spent the morning talking about ukuleles and nationals and ukulele banjos. And he was a very low-key guy. He was wearing a tweed sports jacket with leather patches on the elbows. And so I could only describe him as sort of looking like a college professor. And, but very nice and thoughtful man. And he told me one thing that in my whole life, no one else has ever told me. In fact, I've never heard it from anybody else. And that is, he said, did you know that Mussolini, the dictator of Italy during World War II, was a tenor banjo player? No, no, I never knew that. I never heard of that. So we kidded about it, and I said, you mean like you're home at five o'clock, six o'clock, and the phone rings, and a person calls up, he says, hey, uh, bring your guitar to the castle, because Benito wants to play ragtime tonight. <laughs> and I said, that's so wild, you know, because we know musicians, and they're nice, they're all nice people, musicians, they're all great. So your first instinct is to, first instinct is how bad can you be you play tenor band? I love that that he told me that it was, it was so cool and um, and I'm glad that we met him. We also did business with his partner Paul McCartney. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sir, Mac Sir Paul had a, always had a Hofner Beetle bass, as you know. In fact, it's the only reason it's called a Hofner Beetle bass because he used it. It's actually called a Hofner violin bass, and and for years all through the Beatles period it was misintonating. Do you know what that is? It's when, it's when you put your finger on a particular fret and you expect it to play a particular note, but for some reason it doesn't play that note. It plays a different note. It's either too low or too high. And it, I think it must have driven him crazy because your natural tendency is to compensate subconsciously, after a while, it just becomes second nature, to push a little harder when you play that string on that fret to get it to come up to the pitch that you want it to be. So, his left-hand man whose name is John Hamill, that's his head technician, interviewed five world-class guitar repair shops, seeking to find out how they would repair this problem if they were given an opportunity to. And apparently our shop told him exactly the right answer because about a month later he called up and said, Paul would like you to repair his bass. Oh my God. So they, Paul, uh, sent the uh, violin bass, Hofner, over on the Concord. It had its own seat. That was expensive. And John Hamill brought it in. I was here for three and a half days. It was very difficult, arduous, complicated repair. And our head of repair, who's first class, his name is Flip Van Domberg Scipio at that time, knew what to do. He knew that the manufacturer had put those frets in the, in the wrong spaces and they were slightly off. And so what he had to do was pull the frets that were the offensive ones and fill in the space with the same color wood. And then using logarithm, which is how frets are designed, they're, they're, that's, that's the way they've always been designed, they have to be done that way. He was able to calculate where the right places are and re-inlay those frets into their proper spaces in such a way, and this is, by the way, our definition of professional guitar repair, that when the work is done, there's no indication, no sign, that it would ever tell you that work was ever done. That, that's my definition of what real professional guitar work is, and uh, we work at that level. 
I came in, I knew it was coming in, and I was told that the, the Paul McCartney's Beetle Base was downstairs in the shop, and I have permission to go to the shop. And I was always a huge, huge Beetle fan, so I go to the, the, the workbench where the base is lying, and I look down, and, and I knew of nothing else to do but lean over and kiss it, because it was Paul McCartney's Beetle Base. And this guy went nuts, <laughs> who was the, the bodyguard for the guitar, but the, the, the people in the shop calmed him down and said it was okay. Uh, but that's as close as I've gotten to the, the actual Beatles. And when we returned it uh, to, to John Hamill, who was here the whole time in the daytime, to bring back to Paul, we didn't know what to think because we didn't get any immediate feedback. And we waited, and the fall of that year, in Bass Player Magazine, in an interview, Paul McCartney said, quote, My bass never played in tune, but I brought it to Mandolin Brothers, and they set it straight. Ah, oh, we all <laughs> exhaled simultaneously. So we had no idea how well it went over, but that was so lovely. After that, we did other business with them, too.